Josh? Yes. Hi, Brink. How are you today? How are you doing? Good. You ready to do some uh, libertarian dia vlogging? Uh, I'm, a, I'm all set except for the the uh, jaw pain that I have from being in the, at the uh, dentist uh, this morning, but um, I'm not feeling particularly inhibited by that pain, so let's give it a shot. Okay, very good. Well, uh, libertarian uh, dia vlogging, that's, a, that's quite a euphonious uh, yeah. instruction. Yeah, uh, get it on your bumper Bob sticker. For, uh, yeah. Blame blog, Bob for the dia vlogging, but libertarian, that's my fault. That's, yeah. Uh, for Blogging Heads viewers who, who don't know the term, I, I did an article a few months ago in New Republic where I proposed uh, uh, a possible alliance between liberals and libertarians uh, on uh, as a uh, alternative to the traditional libertarian conservative entente that's uh, been going on for the past several decades. And uh, the clever headline writer came up with libertarian. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I've got and, a lot of uh, syllables for a clever headline writer, but I do have the article right here. I just ha I happen to have it sitting right on the, the top of my desk. You can see that excellent. it's uh, fresh. And the article itself is really an outgrowth of a book I've just written, uh, The Age of Abundance, uh, which I'm putting here in front of the camera, and which comes out uh, May 8th is ready for sale. So Good. Well, anyway. Uh, I, I think we can we can illustrate the uh, uh, the the whole libertarian theme today by talking about a number of specific issues about which we de about which we agree, uh, but for rather different reasons. Uh, so uh, that's it's, there's interest, I think, in the fact that uh, we can get to the same place from uh, from different starting points. And so let's start off with with the Supreme Court's decision last week on partial birth abortion. Uh, tell me what you think about it. Terrible, terrible, stupid, bad decision. Um, I mean, w let me start by saying that the real fault here doesn't lie with the court. The real fault lies with uh, Congress, uh, which passed this law in uh, 2003 and uh, required the court to uh, address it. It's easy to be either overenthusiastic or spend too much time blaming the court. This was, I think, really at bottom a political failure that this law was passed uh, in uh, in the first place. When I say, it's, why is it a terrible decision? Um, in essence, the decision says, so, so there's a procedure, uh, intact dilation and uh, evacuation, intact DE. Right. Terrible procedure, nobody likes it. Uh, sometimes doctors who perform abortions think that it is medically advisable. Uh, it's a, a second trimester procedure. Uh, it's performed both on uh, after viability and before viability. And the decision didn't make any distinction between its performance before and after viability. So right. you have a, a, a fetus, it's say 18 weeks, 19 weeks. It's not viable by anybody's understanding of viability. Um, and the doctor says uh, the medically best procedure for the woman to have is this uh, intact uh, DNA, so-called partial birth. And what the decision says is it's perfectly okay for the woman to have the abortion. She just can't right. use that procedure, even though the doctor has said that it is medically the most advisable procedure. Uh, she can use the standard DNA, uh, which in, in effect involves dismemberment of the fetus rather than this so-called uh, uh, partial birth. So it's a preference on the part of the court that one procedure be used rather than another procedure, even though the doctor's judge, in the doctor's judgment, the, uh, the uh, condemned procedure uh, would be uh, medically advisable, advisable from the point of view of the health of the woman. Uh, so it doesn't, as uh, Justice Ginsburg said, this doesn't save anybody any life. Uh, how it shows respect for human life is not uh, so clear. And uh, it overrides the judgment of the doctor, it overrides the judgment of the uh, woman, and it doesn't respect the line between viability and uh, uh, post-viability. Now, that's just to say that the court upheld 
that judgment made by Congress. So it was a terrible judgment, I think, on the part of the Congress, and everything that I just said applies to Congress as well, and I think an awful judgment on the part of the court uh, to uphold it. That, that's my immediate reaction to the decision. So, let, me, let me just back up a little bit and get your, your broader view on the, uh, on the vexing abortion question. Uh, do I take it that you are... Uh, sort of pro-choice down the line that you're in favor of leaving this up to a woman and her doctor uh, till, you know, as, until the end, until the third trimester, or is there some point at which uh, it's okay for the democratic process to come in and uh, and set rules and regulations and restrictions on on what can be done and how it can be done? Uh, I I think. There are two issues here, and as you know, in the, about abortion. There's a there's you know, kind of moral positions about abortion, and then there are political positions about abortion. Right. So, on the political position about abortion, I mean, uh, the, the, the position from the point of view of political morality of what's a, a legitimate and acceptable um, regulatory regime. Uh, I do think that it is, uh, and it, it is. Pol- politically legitimate for there to be uh, post-viability um, uh, restrictions. I think it's permit. It's, if states don't have them, that's okay. Uh, but if states do have uh, restrictions that, that apply uh, after uh, viability, I think viability is a reasonable um, uh, line to draw. That Roe v. Wade drew the line at the end of the second trimester because that was at the time more or less for all practical purposes coincident with viability. Casey right. that line's moving over time. Moved, said the line is moving over time. Casey respected the idea that viability is really what's important from the point of view of regulation but said that um, there can be uh, restrictions during the second trimester uh, because uh, 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 you know, viability doesn't really coincide with um, uh, the end of the, the uh, second trimester. Nevertheless, you couldn't impose uh, undue uh, burdens. Uh, and it was also true that uh, there, there are two grounds for regulation. One ground for regulation is uh, um, respect for the value of human life, the protection of innocent life. <coughs> and the other is uh, concerns about uh, a woman's health. One of the most... Def- and, 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 and those... Uh, uh, have pertinence uh, in, in the uh, later t- uh, during a, uh, a pregnancy, but the right. human life, particularly during the third trimester, I think that's a legitimate judgment. Um, but the, uh, the one of the worst things, which I didn't mention before, about the, the the recent Supreme Court decision is that what they said was that this was a, a legitimate, an acceptable regulation because what it showed was a concern for the psychological health of a woman who has an intact DNA procedure, which she may later live to regret. What I find inconceivable is that there could be a regulation that particularly pertained to men, and the court expressing that kind of solicitude, that kind of patronizing solicitude, for the subsequent regrets of men that they had had a uh, uh, no, I, yeah, I, I thought that kind of paternalistic language in, in horrible in Kennedy's opinion was uh, was. Uh, but the just issue out of is bounds. now. I think what this decision really announces, and it's an announcement that's been coming for a long time, is that people who are pro-choice really have to think not just of litigation strategies but also of political strategies for protecting uh, uh, a woman's uh, r- right to choose. Well, let, me, let me back up just a little bit, and, and then I'll, I'll give you my two cents on this. But uh, the, the line you draw of, of viability strikes me as a, as a reasonable one. I, I, I think any line we draw here on this question is going to be uh, it's going to be arbitrary at the margin, uh, moving something one day forward or one day back. There's no particularly good reason, but you have to draw a line somewhere. Anyway, uh, the, the viability line strikes me as having a certain amount of, uh, of sense behind it. But, uh, and that's, that's good for you as a voter. That would be good for you as a legislator. Uh, but but why, is, uh, why is, is 
the political process to be prevented from drawing a line somewhere else. I, I know that in your day job, you're a political philosopher, yeah, and in particular, yeah. you uh, do a lot of work on uh, you're a, uh, on deliberative democracy, and on and on. Uh, you consider yourself. Uh, uh, very much of a supporter of even radical democracy, uh, which suggests to me that uh, that uh, that you leave things up to people to decide collectively the rules under which they live. And and whatever you think of uh, this procedure, which bans a type of abortion, even if it leaves other types of abortions uh, uh, legal, uh, this law was overwhelmingly popular. Uh, the decision is overwhelmingly popular, and uh, I believe it. The law passed Congress uh, in pretty good bipartisan fashion. So. So where, as a, as a very strongly uh, committed Democrat, do you, uh, do you find the, the ground on which to stand to tell people they can't make this decision? Well, I am a strong and committed Democrat, and like most strong and committed Democrats, I think that uh, there are lots of areas of uh, decision-making uh, where the majority support doesn't really say very much. I mean, for example, if the majority supports racial apartheid, of the kind that we had in the United States, uh, you know, some say we still have, but legally, it's the kind that we had in the United States uh, <coughs> until the period Brown v. Board of Education, uh, Civil Rights Act, etc., uh, I don't think that's legitimate in virtue of right. having majority support. Uh, I don't think people's rights to freedom of expression, I don't think their rights to uh, religious liberty are uh, up, for, up for majority grabs. I think in the issue about um, abortion, there are a couple of things that are at stake. First of all, I think it's fundamental that if you have a very restrictive um, re regulatory s system on abortion, uh, it just, what you're really doing is excluding women from equal standing in the political process and in society generally. So you can't treat women as equal members of the society and have a restrictive uh, regulatory regime on, uh, on abortion. It, I'm yeah, not I saying what the polling numbers are for women on partial birth abortion. I just don't know. I have to ask our readers to look that up, but I wouldn't be surprised if... Uh, if Lots of women were I, I opposed be, to this. I, I wouldn't be surprised by that either. I don't mean to be saying. I, I, I think that you could have a a more. I think you could have a more restrictive second trimester regulatory system uh, without having the kind of ex, you know exclusionary impact that I'm describing. Uh, I think there's right. something offensive about singling out this particular procedure. Uh, and saying it's okay to regulate it, uh, even though we're not going to regulate D&E generally. There's something offensive about the, the, the decision. That's why I was focusing on. But uh, what I'm saying, I'm, let me say, what I think the values are that are at stake here, that a, that a committed Democrat ought to be attentive to her, first of all, this issue about the equality of women as participants in society. Uh, secondly, uh, a respect for the... Uh, judgment of women, uh, conscientiously made judgment about how they live their lives and also their own conscientious judgment on the undecided and probably undecidable question of when the fetus becomes a person entitled to be treated with concern and respect. Um, that's a deeply disputed question. It's disputed among people who have profound religious convictions. You know, St. Thomas Aquinas thought that abortion was okay up until 18 weeks. Right. Because that's when quickening is. So there's a disputed, deeply disputed question. I oh, think of course. You have, yeah, go ahead. No, I, I, I agree with you on the bottom line, uh, but, but it's for precisely that reason that I don't consider myself a very strong Democrat. I, I, I'm an instrumental Democrat. When, when democracy or democratic procedures... Uh, are dependably a bulwark of uh, the principles of free society. I, I think they're great, but uh, when they uh, when they threaten uh, 
uh, uh, our freedoms than uh, as they can uh, with the tyranny of the majority. Uh, then, then I'm looking to yeah. well, I don't to identify wall, off, wall off our freedoms from democratic control. I don't think that I, I don't think of democracy as um, the, the same as, as the same as majoritarianism. I think majorit majoritarianism is at best, under some circumstances and for some issues, a way of implementing the more fundamental democratic idea, which is that when we that we ought to that the decisions that regulate our conduct are decisions that ought to be made collectively. And collectively means with due respect for the concerns, the judgments, and the interests of everybody who's regulated by the decisions. I don't think that there's any rationale for having a restrictive regime on uh, abortion that is attentive to the, uh, appropriately attentive to the equal standing of women and respectful of the fact that there is fundamental, deep, profound, pervasive and persistent disagreement on this issue, and disagreement on this issue not between people who care about morality and people who don't care about morality, right. but difference between people who have different conscientious convictions. The great remark that was made on this uh, point was made by uh, then uh, Governor Cuomo in his Notre Dame speech in 1984. But what Cuomo pointed out was that um, the the very, he said that the very people that we Catholics, he's speaking at Notre Dame, the very people right. that we Catholics are fighting with on the abortion issue are the people who are marching with us on a whole range of other social justice issues. So we can't say about people who are opposing us on this issue that they don't care about morality. They're nihilists. They're relativists. They think anything goes in life. These are people with whom, who are moral citizens with whom we have a profound moral disagreement. And then there's a deep question of what do you do when you live in a democracy and you care about the idea of collective decisions, you care about the idea that these are public affairs. How do you, make, how do you go about making decisions on those fundamentally disputed um, moral questions, and, and no, I think I, it, that, I agree. And, I, and let me just uh, chime in with with why I don't like this decision very much because it's it's quite a different set of reasons. Although it, it ties into what you were just talking about, uh, and that is that people of goodwill disagree about this uh, this very difficult issue. Uh, and you know, I I've always been frustrated by the abortion debate because, and it's illustrative of. Of, uh, of how sort of dumbing down our polarizing politics of red versus blue uh, is. And, and my book is really uh, uh, in large part about how this red versus blue polarization arose and, and, and how it's, uh, it, it doesn't map very well to our, <coughs> to our evolving social realities here in the United States and our politics has lagged far behind our, uh, our, uh, our social development. Anyway, um, You've got, uh, you typically have just uh, the pro-choicers versus the pro-lifers, and so if you're pro-choice, you don't like this decision, and uh, if you're pro-life, you do. And I uh, come out in some sort of mushy middle. I, 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 uh, I, I'm troubled by the practice of abortion. I, I, I consider it uh, getting pregnant or getting someone pregnant uh, without intending to bring a child into the world to be an, an irresponsible act, and, and therefore... Uh, having an abortion is something that, that should be cause for regret. Um, on the other hand, uh, I think it's uh, a very difficult call that I would like to leave with, uh, with people involved, and therefore I am in support of abortion on demand, at least uh, through the first trimester. Then, on the other hand, going back, I think that at some point uh, you've, uh, you've made your choice, that if you wait around for months and months and you know you're pregnant and you still don't uh, decide to terminate that pregnancy, at, at some point we don't quite know where to draw the line, but at some point before the, the baby uh, emerges from, from the mother at term, uh, I think that, uh, that this fetus this is, is, becomes a human being uh, with uh, a person with, with legal rights. I, I don't buy the idea that personhood with rights starts at conception, uh, but I don't, uh, I don't buy that it's delayed all the way till the moment of birth. So somewhere in that fuzzy area, and I would say somewhere after the first trimester, I, I think that, uh, that appropriate democratic compromises uh, can be made. 
I further uh, agree with you uh, that um, that people of goodwill are going to come down on this issue in very different ways, and they're going to have intractable differences. And and so I tend to be supportive of a of a kind of cultural federalism on this issue that that different. Uh, jurisdictions, in particular different states, uh, ought to be able to have their diff different rules. And even though I support the bottom line of, of Roe versus Wade, of particularly uh, protecting uh, uh, protecting abortion on demand in the first trimester, and uh, nonetheless, I I find that the the political effects of Roe have been have been terrible. Uh, that they have frozen this issue, cut the whole issue off from democratic debate, prevented the kinds of reasonable, common-sense compromises that could have been made and that would have made different allowances for different social ethoses in different parts of the country. Uh, and so uh, it has given the issue over to extremists on both sides, has turned this into a, a cause for polarization, and, uh, and, and generally I think the, the political consequences of this well-intentioned decision have, have been woeful. Uh, so I, I'm not a big fan of Roe, uh, but uh, finally, I, I think that this, that this decision uh, is upholding a, uh, a law passed by Congress at the national level. And I don't, uh, I don't know what business Congress has uh, passing nationwide abortion laws one way or the other. Uh, I'm an old-fashioned uh, enumerated powers kind of guy. That's what we believe in at the Cato Institute, and, and I, I have a a fairly narrow reading of, of, of Congress's power to regulate interstate commerce, and at any rate, I think a fairly broad reading. I, I don't see what in the world uh, these kinds of decisions have to do with interstate commerce. And so I, uh, I'd like to see this law struck down as, as, uh, as uh, beyond Congress's power to, to regulate. Well, what we Interest know is... Interestingly, yeah, uh, Justice Thomas raised the issue uh, and said that, that this wasn't briefed and therefore he's not uh, going to... Uh, uh, to reach it here, but it's at least possible that someone down the line is going to challenge this law on uh, Commerce Clause grounds, and, and then we'll see what happens. Yeah, um, I think the thing that we understand about the passage of this act in 2003 was that it really had nothing to do with partial, so-called partial birth abortion, what doctors call intact D&E, &E. um, and you probably can tell what somebody's position on the issue is by Right, what they call it. By what they call it. The language in, in the majority opinion and uh, Justice Ginsburg's dissent in the case are very uh, different from one another on this and on many other issues. But uh, this wasn't about this procedure. What, what uh, it was was an effort to push back against the court and see, to, to continue a kind of... Um, you know, war of maneuver uh, on to see if there was some place where you could get the, the uh, court to uh, open things up a little bit. It was predictable. No, it, 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 you're right. It's, it's definitely a, a change in strategy by the pro-life side. They've they've tried to go for you know the uh, the deep ball to overturn Roe uh, by uh, stacking the court appropriately, and that hasn't worked out so well. So they figure they'll try an inter incremental strategy. But that's you know that's the way politics works. Right. Uh, well, so what I think that's why I said earlier, Brink, that I think that what what, what um, this decision really announces it's been coming for a long time is that it's very much time for people who are on the pro-choice side of this issue uh, to think that um, this is not going to be an, an issue that's decided in the courts. It's going to be an issue that's going to be decided in probably not in Congress, but in 50 uh, state legislatures. Some people think that's how it should have been all along. What they say is, you look at the uh, abortion laws on the books in California and New York in 1970 or 71, they say right. project outward from there, and probably by 1980 or 1985, given the, already some of the rollbacks on availability, they say, I don't agree with this, but they say access would have been the same uh, in a world in which you hadn't had Roe v. Wade, uh, the issue had been pursued through the legislatures, it wouldn't have pissed off people on the right so much, on the, the cultural, the conservative right so much, because they wouldn't have thought that their uh, power as citizens was being taken away by the courts. Right. It wouldn't but, have you know, been mobilized. Pretty, that's pretty much what and, uh, yeah. I wouldn't be so rosy as to say the situation would be the same as as it is today under Roe, because, I mean, the fact is the U.S. has just about the most liberal uh, abortion regime on the planet. Uh, and I don't think it would uh, if if we didn't have this constitutional uh, ruling. 
but my guess is we'd have, uh, you know, relatively liberal abortion regimes in most states. You may have uh, outliers like Utah or Mississippi or something, uh, but but by and large, uh, it would be uh, it, <clears throat> we didn't need the uh, the Roe decision to get us a long way towards protection of a woman's right to choose. Yeah, and, so and the just, time is I, to I think this is yeah, uh, you know, whether, have to mobilize. Well, of course, we'll never know. Uh, but right now, and this is a good segue, uh, we're seeing a, 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 another contentious social red versus blue kind of issue play out on a state-by-state -state basis. Uh, just yesterday, the New Hampshire legislature uh, passed – a civil unions uh, bill, uh, the Senate, uh, the New Hampshire Senate yesterday passed it. Earlier in the month, uh, the House had passed it, and the governor said it, uh, he's going to sign it. So uh, New Hampshire joins uh, a growing number of states that uh, are either recognizing gay marriage, as in the case of Massachusetts, or recognizing civil unions, as, uh, as here, and, and I believe New Jersey, and or some kind of domestic partnership or some kinds of rights for gay couples is now, uh, I don't know, a half dozen or more states have done. And, and so here we are seeing uh, a, a case where uh, the other strategy is playing out. Uh, there's, we're not going to, I think, see a court that rules that gay marriage is, is required under the Equal Protection Clause. I, I think that's safe to say. To Roe. Yeah. Yeah, that's safe uh, to say. Likewise, uh, the, the federal marriage amendment that uh, Bush and the Republican Congress uh, had these votes on uh, isn't going to go anywhere, and therefore we're not going to have state-level experimentation foreclosed by a constitutional amendment. And so we're going to play this thing out uh, one state at a time in 50 states. And here's a, an issue, gay marriage, that has just come out of nowhere in the past 10 or 15 years. Uh, before that, uh, it, wasn't, it just wasn't on the gay rights agenda at all. Uh, and it's gone from being something that was beyond the pale to uh, to being uh, something that is that is steadily picking up momentum. And I think, in particular, for a state like New Hampshire, which uh, 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 has a you know a, a reputation of being a pretty conservative place, certainly on the economic front, it's uh, it's it's a very libertarian place. It's got civil unions and, and no income tax. And from what I've read in the uh, in the accounts uh, about this bill, there's another piece of legislation going through of, that, uh, that would make New Hampshire the last state in the union to mandate seatbelt use, and that's kicked up a lot more fuss than, uh, than the civil unions uh, issue. So anyway, uh, we've got a, a, a state that, that isn't Massachusetts. It's rather different from the, the stereotypical uh, you know, liberal kind of uh, place that has is, that is put this into effect rather uncontroversially, and my guess it's a, it's a harbinger of things to come. Yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> I think, uh, you know, on this one, I would distinguish two questions. What, one for me as a, in my uh, professional, you know, my day job as a political philosopher and the other uh, in my thinking as a, about political strategy, uh, I, I, I think um, that the absence of this, of uh, a right to form civil unions, recognized partnerships, maybe marriage itself, uh, irrespective of uh, sexual orientation, I think this is a it's, it's a it's a bad thing. I think it's a violation of a, a, a an important right. Uh, the question then is how best to vindicate that right. Right. And that I think is an entirely separate question, which un you know, unfortunately, I think we understand the reasons why, but unfortunately. There's been this tendency because of the highly litigious character of the United States, the kind of tendency to judicialize politics. Right. Um, the, 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 there's been this tendency to think that if you've got a, a basic right and the right is not being protected, that the way to ensure the protection of that right is by going to courts. And I think you're, I, here I very much agree that probably um, – the most effective strategy for uh, vindicating the right of people to form rec you know, legally recognized unions, uh, irrespective of sexual orientation, is by the by doing it through politics. Uh, it's be first of all because the courts are pretty much hopeless on this question now, and secondly, it's less likely to produce the kind of uh, pushback 
uh, that you see in the abortion case. And I think here, what I, what I would expect to happen is something maybe like what happened in the case of um, anti-miscegenation laws. So by the time the Supreme Court took up the, the issue of anti-miscegenation laws, which was in 1967, the case of Loving versus Virginia, yes, uh, there were there's a terrible movie uh, about this uh, called The Lovings of Virginia or something like that. Anyway, the case was decided in 1967, and it's extraordinary that 40 years ago there were still laws against interracial marriage on the books in the United States. I, as I remember, those laws were in about 16 states, probably 30 years earlier, 50 years earlier, they were on the laws in all the states, or virtually yes, all the and, states. And so they're revoked, so, they're revoked, enforced. they're revoked, and enforced. And what happened, by the way, this was, in, in the Loving cases, it's very interesting. This was not a case in which the laws were not being enforced. What happened was this couple left the state to get married, Mr. and Mrs. Loving. They left the state to get married. They got married, as I recall, in D.C. When they came back to Virginia, they were arrested, and they were put on trial, and the punishment was that they had to leave the state of Virginia for about 20 years or something like that. And in the decision, the district court judge said, uh, this is pretty close to a quotation, that uh, God put the different races white, melee, yellow, red, and brown on different continents because he didn't want them to mix. There you go. And, um, so th th that was where we were 40 years ago. The Supreme Court overturned it. Intelligent by the, design. Yeah by, the, by the time, yeah, by the time the Supreme Court overturned it, it was, the issue was, as my legal friends say, uh, ripe. Right. Uh, whereas the, the, now the back of resistance to the, that yeah, that's right. by, the, by that time. Or, that's right. And no, I think I, the I same is you. true. I, I think yeah. if, yeah. if uh, th there are good, solid, equal protections arguments for constitutionalizing a, a right to same-sex uh, marriage, but, but uh, you know, jurisprudence is not just the jurist's part, but it's also the prudence part, and, and I, think it would, I think it would backfire horribly. If, uh, if we had a court that were, in which that was a live possibility, I'm afraid it would, uh, it would just produce terrible political backlash. Let me, let me use the, uh, the New Hampshire uh, law to, to ride one other hobby horse, which is if you look at the, look at the uh, now most liberal states when it comes to uh, same-sex unions and partnerships and marriages, uh, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, New Jersey, California, uh, Vermont, uh, they're, uh, Connecticut, they're more or less the richest states in the country. Uh, so there's a, there's a very clear uh, correlation here between high per capita income or successful economic development and what we would consider to be enlightened liberal social attitudes, uh, which, again, harkens back to my book, uh, which is about how capitalism and capitalist development, uh, uh, by producing uh, these kind of unprecedented uh, conditions of, of prosperity, has affected a real cultural transformation, has really changed people's values and changes the way people think, uh, and, and, and I, what I consider to be a progressive and, and laudable direction. Uh, yeah, fortunately for the better. Could change the way they think for the worse, but in these cases, fortunately for the better. But, you know, yeah, if these uh, issues break... And I would argue across a, a broad uh, array of, of values, it, it has changed things for the better. And, and so part of my message and part of the message of the Libertarians article is for, is for progressives to wake up and, and realize what a friend they have in, in capitalist growth uh, because it, uh, it shifts people from red to blue. This was one of the one of the many many things on which Adam Smith and Karl Marx agreed. Yes, uh, capitalism is good for growth, and economic growth over the long term is pretty good for uh, um, enlightened understanding. Animated and, uh, by Ben Friedman at Harvard has, has written this book, the I can't with consequences of economic growth or. Anyway, uh, a, a, a love note to the beneficent social consequences of yeah. Uh, so long as so, you know, so long as we don't wreck the planet, uh, which yeah. is a, you know a real uh, danger. So long as we don't do that, uh, I'm, I'm kind of I'm, I'm sort of with you on uh, 
the virtues okay. of... Uh, well, good. The, well, let's uh, move on to another thing. But, but I just uh, want to say one thing on the politics here. I'm in constant agreement with you on, on this particular, and that is on the on the upcoming presidential election. Last night was the, uh, was the first... Uh, presidential debate amongst the Democratic candidates. Uh, I got a chance to watch it. I understand you were teaching and didn't get a teaching. chance. But I was teaching a course on global justice while it was on. Uh, let me let me make a confession at the outset. I I have uh, my first uh, election that I was old enough to vote in was 1980, and since then I have yet to vote for a Democrat for president. I have uh, I voted for Republicans. I've uh, I voted for the Libertarian guy one time. I've sat them out in a disaffected huff on a couple of occasions, uh, but it is my goal uh, in this new libertarian spirit I'm exploring uh, to vote for a Democrat uh, in 08, and uh, especially on uh, on foreign policy and, and civil liberties grounds. And so uh, it was uh, it was a, a new way of watching uh, Democratic candidates for me as actually taking seriously the idea of, of pulling the lever for one of these. Uh, right, as folks. an engaged but, uh, actor rather than a bemused spectator. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Uh, so, uh, anyway. Uh, so what just, did you think? I was, let, me just, let me just tell you a little bit about what I, as my kind of Martian observer of Democratic candidates, uh, uh, what the impression I came off with. At first, as, as you know, there wasn't a lot of news made. It was uh, the whole format. There were so many candidates, eight candidates and uh, and they could only give 60 second answers and so it didn't really lend itself to any back and forth in fact they were prohibited from talking back and forth to each other asking each other questions so it was all very nice and polite and, and I think they were striving to, to have a common front against Bush and not start tearing into each other this early uh, but it was a good opportunity to to, uh, to see them all standing up uh, in, on the same stage and do some uh, comparison shopping. I, I haven't been paying much attention thus far because I've been afraid that uh, once I did start paying attention, the, the clock would start running until I just got uh, sick to death of the whole thing. So my clock's now running. Uh, but I, uh, I would say that I was most impressed with, uh, with Clinton. Uh, I, uh, she's not someone that I've been terribly fond of, but I, I, her, just on style points, I thought she was authoritative and commanding and looked like a commander-in-chief and uh, swatted the softballs out of the park and uh, really was on top of her game. Uh, Obama, by contrast, whom uh, the, I've... Uh, just been wowed by his political skills up to now. I thought he was sort of awkward and a little bit nervous and fumbling, and maybe this format didn't suit him. He likes to give longer answers that he can kind of wind up for. And uh, but anyway, he was uh, he uh, he wasn't especially impressive, uh, at least to me. And Edwards, what did you think uh, of uh, the other? You know, Edwards, the other uh, sort of top tier candidate. Um, He's just everything about his persona is calculated to turn me off. Uh, I'm, I'm a born and bred Southerner, and uh, all my 100% uh, Southern stock. Uh, but uh, the 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 calculated folksiness and smarmy trial lawyer charm thing just uh, is a total turn off for me. But it, uh, I, I recognize he, he he does have real political skills, and he, he seemed to be doing his thing pretty effectively. Uh, the the guy that I came in. Wanting to root for uh, because his policy uh, stances are more libertarian-ish than, uh, than most of the other candidates on the domestic policy front with, is Bill Richardson. But I thought he was just awful. Uh, he he just uh, didn't. He's not a serious and, candidate, uh, and uh, looked really uncomfortable and uh, just uh, d just did not look like a credible presidential candidate to me. Uh, maybe he'll up his game, but uh, I thought he bombed. Not a serious candidate. I mean, my problem, I, uh, I, I have a, three problems with Hillary Clinton. First of all, I do think she shares um, considerably in the uh, blame for the failure of health care reform in the early 1990s when you had a fantastic opportunity for it. You share the blame. Her husband yes. gets a bunch of the blame, too. But I think there was a really a gigantic opportunity lost, and it was partly because of the style of policymaking that they uh, went oh, in. Well, that's for sure. They, yes. They had a political opportunity. They, they had blew. a great opportunity. This was, you know, Shriver had won the Pennsylvania Senate race in 1990 on this issue. Massive support for it. Everybody thought there's going to be reform. The question is what kind of reform they blew it. Secondly, uh, on Iraq, uh, this 
this line about if I had known then what I knew now, I wouldn't have supported, I think is completely bogus. She was not at the wheel, but she was, so she couldn't have been asleep at the wheel. But right. she didn't do due diligence on the policy. The fact is that lots of people in 2002 into 2003 didn't believe the weapons of mass destruction story. They didn't think the case had been made. Lots of people believed that Saddam Hussein could be contained, didn't require an uh, invasion. Lots of people thought inspections should go forward. Lots of people pointed out that the, though this was a tyrannical, terrible regime, that it was not then you know, actively engaged in mass slaughter of population. This was not a cer cer situation of rescue and emergency. So uh, p people believe this. 25 people voted against, 25 senators, as Lincoln Chafee pointed out in an op-ed not so long ago, which was basically directed against Hillary Clinton, 25 members of the Senate were worried enough about the policy then to, to have uh, 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 said things, to vote against the resolution. So I think the issue isn't that she didn't know then what she knows now. I think the issue is that she jumped on board, she didn't do due diligence, and I think that's a serious problem about her. But really the most fundamental problem, uh, trouble that I have with Clinton, and this could change, is that I think she is, to use a familiar phrase, a divider, not a uniter. And uh, there are lots of people, including lots of Democrats, who have real troubles with her. Her negatives are already very high. And, you know, I, I wouldn't want to throw somebody in jail because they have high negatives, but we're talking about somebody becoming president. And I think, given the, the politics of the past 15 years, to have somebody come into the office who on day one is going to be running in the you know, low third, lower, maybe high 30s on their negatives before they, just after they take them to the oath of office, is not a good thing for American politics. Don't feel yeah, happy I, about I, that. I agree with that. That's, I, I, that's a troubling first thing. First of all, I have, I have, on the issue of, of her war stance, uh, I have some sympathy for her position because I, too, supported the war back then, and uh, so... Uh, I, I understand the mistake she made, uh, and as far as the major candidates are concerned, only Obama really has clean hands on this. Uh, Edwards uh, voted for the war as well. Right, and Obama uh, had the advantage of the time being in the state senate in Illinois, correct. not in uh, not in the senate or the house, and so it was a little bit easier for him to take that position. Absolutely, and, 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 and so there were people but, who know, were more cautious, much more. Uh, cautious. You can you can use that vote to question her judgment and and the sort of strength of her political character. Uh, but as far as the bottom line question now, what are we going to do about Iraq? Uh, I think she's about as dependable as anybody else to to get us out of there uh, sooner rather than later, and and that's. I'm not uh, so sure my, about that. that. And the reason yeah, I'm not so sure about that goes priority. to the vote. Uh, so no, I, but I. I, I, I think she's clearly not as as she's more of a hawk. Uh, she was more committed to uh, to Iraq regime change even during the Clinton administration. Uh, uh, so uh, I, I agree that she's she's not as dependably uh, Pacific as, uh, as some of the other candidates. But on this particular issue, my my sense is that she would yeah. she would I, do the I, right I, thing. What I worry on her, about on, on, on her health care blunder, I, I think that's. That kind of cuts both ways in my mind. Uh, that is, uh, clearly, uh, the, the health care reform uh, episode just smacked of hubris, and, and they just got their heads handed to them. And I think there may be something actually positive about having someone had a, a major blow-up where hubris led to a downfall. It may encourage a kind of humility uh, that, I, that you don't always see in occupants of the White House, certainly not in this one. Um, right. Pride goeth before the fall, except I haven't seen, in her case, I haven't seen that learning. And what I worry about on the Iraq issue is that the vote in 2002 was a symptom of a problem. The problem is that uh, the way of, that uh, she will feel, that she, she'll feel a need to demonstrate her seriousness, you know, her bona fides on right. security issues by, by uh, being, you know, this sort of fake Bush administration type tough. And so I'm not so sure that she is as reliable on ending this war as some of the other candidates. And th if this war continues, 
it's not, it's going to continue to kill American soldiers, it's going to continue to kill thousands of Iraqis, it's going to continue to roil the region, and it's going to continue to be an even more serious distraction in the country from addressing a whole range of serious problems that need to be addressed. So I think, yeah, you know, I'm, Obama I'm says... Yeah, I on that. I think uh, I don't see that we're serving any discernible national security interests by staying there, and I think we're, we're subverting a whole host of, uh, of important so national Obama security interests point by staying one there. Is, so, so I want to I yeah, get out. Right. Um, Obama says point let, one... Let me, just, let me just say one thing about, uh, about her high negatives, because in my mind, uh, as the... Uh, as the unaccustomed uh, potential Democratic voter uh, and the kind of conflicted uh, uh, Democratic voter, it, it cuts two ways. On a purely Machiavellian level, the fact that she has such high negatives is kind of a plus for me because I disagree with a lot of her domestic policy views, and, and so uh, she, she, her ability to do harm will be circumscribed by the fact that she's not going to have a big popular mandate swelling behind her. On the other hand, uh, taking a, a, perhaps a, a broader and loftier view, I agree with you completely that, that the polarization of the past, not just the Bush years, but the Clinton years, is just has been noxious for the country and is just bad news. And I would desperately like to, to have a politics with, a, with a, a less rancorous tone, and there's just almost no chance of such a thing under a Clinton administration. Yeah, I agree uh, with you about that, and I think there is, and, and just looking at the other candidates on that issue, I, I think if I were judging just on that issue, I would have to say that Obama is certainly the strongest candidate. I, I think Edwards... Uh, there's a, you know, similar possibilities, not quite Clintonian, Clintonian levels, but similar possibilities for a kind of polarization. Because I think do p a number of people, you don't have to be from the South to feel that response to his, uh, as you describe it, his sw smarmy style. I mean, I kind of like him. I like the policy views. I think he staked out some strong positions, but that would be a worry in his case as well. I think o Obama, whose policy positions I like less than Edwards', is, I think really appreciates this, the importance of that issue more than anybody else. And I think it was kind of visible in his, um, in the, the speech that he made on, I guess it was on Wednesday before the debate, the foreign policy speech that he made. I mean, uh, people have complained a little bit. I know Steve Clements was on with uh, Bob Wright on the Blogging Heads show uh, uh, the other day, and they were yep, commenting I saw that. in the speech. Yeah, and Steve was complaining that there was a certain lack of specificity in, in the speech, and and uh, David Brooks in a what I what I'll, I think was a characteristically whiny David Brooks column was complaining a, a little bit about Obama on this. Uh, but the thing is, this was not a, um, a budget document. Uh, this was. A speech. A speech. It was a speech designed to provide some kind of orientation, and I think there were a few very important points of orientation. First of all, like it or not, and I like it, you may not, this is somebody who has m a real difference with the uh, Bush people on the multilateralism issue. This is somebody who's not going to be out appointing John Bolton's and people who are going to be trashing the UN or other multilateral institutions, even if he thinks, you know, that there's got to be some reform in those institutions. He sees right. them having an essential role. Secondly, uh, he understands that uh, an even greater threat than global warming is the issue of nuclear proliferation and the possibility uh, of a nuclear 9-11 with loose uh, nukes, the problem that Graham Allison has been talking about tirelessly yep. for, you know, for the last uh, uh, decade, uh, and that Sam Nunn and Senator Lugar have been very involved in. One of his main points is to address the issue of uh, nuclear proliferation, and he said in that context, he mentioned the importance of leading by example. Don't tell other people not to develop these weapons while you're developing a new generation of them. You've got to be continuing the process of uh, uh, building these down. And then also, uh, he, so multilateralism, that was one of his five points. Um, Non-proliferation, another one of his uh, five points. And the last of the five points, I haven't mentioned the first two, that's about Iraq and about rebuilding the army. So, right. The last one was about foreign assistance. He's talking about doubling the... Uh, the, uh, the, the amount of foreign uh, aid that we give. I thought there was something very interesting in that context, which was, I, I did a search through the speech 
to see where he used the term human rights. And the term human rights never occurred in the speech, despite the emphasis on the moral importance of providing greater foreign assistance. And so I think this, rep this I, my suspicion is that this represents a serious shift, that the focus of an Obama or and maybe of any other Democratic administration, because I don't think he's way out there on this, is going to be less on protecting people from um, the oppressive power of government. Not that he's opposed to human rights, right. but in terms of emphasis, the emphasis is going to be more on what people call sort of second generation human rights, social and economic rights, dealing with issues about a billion people in the world living in destitution, two billion people living in persistent poverty at less than uh, two bucks a day, extremely hard problems to solve, requires more than foreign assistance to solve them. We talked about that last time. But I, I, you know, the, I think the, the shift in focus that there is a fundamental problem of, world, of poverty and destitution that requires address, not mentioning the human rights issue, an important issue. Not that this guy is, an oppo is opposed to human rights, but that he understands that there's another issue out there which has really been going under-addressed. And in the long term, this goes to your issue about the importance of economic growth. You know, in the long term, if you're going to do something on making the world a uh, better and safer and more decent and more livable place, uh, you're going to have to do something on that issue. I thought that was an important emphasis. A lot of details to be filled in. But as I say, this wasn't a, a budget document. It was yeah, a, no, I, a I, I read the speech, and I had uh, a, a basically favorable impression, I ha and I have a basically favorable impression of Obama, despite the fact that on a number of issues uh, I, I strongly disagree with, with policies he's enunciated. But, but on just his persona and, and his biography and his manner and his rhetoric are, are all – Depolarizing on the domestic front in a way that I consider to be uh, to be uh, very positive, and, and also just his his persona is on its own maybe the most important thing he uh, he brings to the foreign policy uh, table as far as an advantage over other candidates. There's just no, nothing that would. Uh, announce a cleaner break uh, uh, from the Bush administration in the election of Barack Obama, and the message that that that, that in all of its dimensions would send to the rest of the world uh, would, I think, be uh, would be immensely positive. Whether that's enough to to, to recommend uh, his election is, is a different question, but that thing on its own, I think, is a big plus for him. On on the on the substance of his foreign policy vision speech, um, uh, you know, number one was get out of Iraq, and and I uh, I agree with that. Uh, and number two was was a big uh, a big increase, a big push uh, for mopping up uh, loose nukes and uh, enriched, uran <clears throat> enriched uranium, uh, and and doing all we can on a number of other fronts to. To prevent a nuclear 9/11, and and I think that is uh, that's the number one national security threat to the United States. Period. Uh, and it's it's just mind-boggling to me as someone who actually voted for George W. Bush because uh, uh, I thought he was uh, the the guy to handle uh, the post 9/11 world. How cavalierly uh, he has uh, he is. Uh, not devoted uh, attention to to this issue. Uh, uh, on another recent blogging heads, Joe Cirincioni of the Center for American Progress had some very interesting things to say uh, with his own. He's got a new book out, and, and he's got a plan that sounds very similar to Obama's to to accelerate programs already in effect and uh, give them more money uh, and uh, and. Uh, and we're, we're racing against time before some group of bad guys gets their hands on on uh, on bomb grade material, and it's Freeze, just on insane. This point, I just, so that we're not doing everything in our power to uh, to to eliminate that threat. So by elevating that and making that one of the sort of centerpieces of his foreign policy, I, I consider that to be a, a huge uh, plus. On that on this issue about the loose nukes and the fact that the Bush administration didn't do anything on this issue, I absolutely agree this is the number one security threat to the United States, nuclear proliferation more generally. But this issue in particular, you get a nuclear 9-11 just in New York, now add New York and Chicago, and... Now, that, that's the end of the, the end of the game. Now, right. there are things. This is what Graham Allison has been pushing. There are th lots of 
clear things to be done about this issue. The problem is, problem for the Bush administration, has been that doing any of those things requires going back on the idea that multilateralism is a bad word. You can't do it on your own. It requires cooperation. It requires cooperation with Russia in the first place. It requires figuring out some way to deal with the problem. It's not an Iran problem. It's a Pakistan problem. Right. Uh, that's the, probably the most serious place for, where concerns about leakage uh, obtain outside of the case of the, Soviet, uh, uh, the former Soviet Union, R- Russia. But doing something about this requires a collaborative effort. But if you think that collaboration, cooperation, multilateralism is the name of a terminal illness, which is what the, Bush administra- the way the Bush administration has, has uh, acted, you can't do anything about this problem. So you have a choice. You can either accept them that... Interdependence, it, uh, this is a Bob Wright point, interdependence is not a choice, it's a fact of life. The way to address yeah. problems then is co- through some kind of cooperation. If you can't do that, if you think it's a bad thing, if you think it's an erosion of sovereignty, it's a threat to the nation, you're not going to be able to address what we agree is the largest security threat to the nation. No, I, I think on know, that happy note, I have to fail uh, out of I don't, I don't want to defend it, but it's <clears throat> because it's indefensible. Uh, but uh, it, it hasn't eschewed multilateral action across the board. Of course, it's it's pursued uh, uh, working through Europe on the Iran question diplomatically. It's done the six-party talks uh, with North Korea. So it hasn't just been going unilaterally on on all the different uh, issues that it's dealing with. But it but it does have a a kind of expressed contempt for uh, international institutions that, that I just don't think serves our interests. I, I am by no means uh, romantic uh, or have a romanticized view about the quality of our international institutions, and, and I don't have very high hopes for what they can accomplish, and probably much uh, uh, much more uh, modest expectations than, uh, than you might have or that Bob Wright might have. But nonetheless, you just don't go, uh, uh, you know, ticking people off uh, uh, without uh, without any reason, it just doesn't. It just hasn't served our purposes to go alienating people and setting ourselves in defiance of uh, the rest of the world. And yeah, it's just well, not you smart. think you know uh, you so think you're I, you think you're pissing in your neighbor's pool, and you're really pissing in your own pool to put it right. uh, to put a a uh, colloquial face on it. Um, and uh, on the on the foreign aid front, uh, here I'm, I'm sure we have disagreements. Uh, I that is I I don't think foreign aid is the answer to global poverty. Uh, I think that uh, that it is at best a, a palliative and, and not a cure. That is that I, I do think that that foreign assistance uh, can alleviate suffering and it can do good in the world and uh, and. Uh, and on a just a real politic uh, level, it can burnish America's image, uh, and and that can serve our interests. So I think there's a place for it, uh, but uh, uh, but I I don't think that the track record of a foreign aid as an agent of transformation, as a way to lift the world out of poverty, uh, really you know has much to recommend it. And uh, we can we talked about this a little last time, and it's too big a topic to dive back into again. But but at any rate, uh, I would uh, if if we're uh, going to shift some of our national security spending. Uh, away from uh, from Department of Homeland Security pork and Cold War era military systems, uh, and towards uh, more manpower, as Obama suggests, and more overseas assistance. I, I would consider that to be uh, uh, on net uh, 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 improvement over the status quo. I'm afraid that uh, I have to go talk about how, to a group of, uh, listen to a talk about how you make rational decisions in the face of the potential for horrible disasters, and uh, so I'm going to have to end this. But I Okay, very good. Well, we agreed it. about a bunch of stuff for different reasons, and maybe next time uh, we can get together and uh, just go at each other's throats about something. I hope but so. Nice okay, talking good to you. Good to talk, yeah. Bye-bye.